The New Testament lesson comes from the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew and begins at the 18th verse. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of the word. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you'd open our hearts and our minds, that not only would we be hearers of your word, but that we would be doers as well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amazingly, we are now standing at the door of Christmas. And it's just like, you know, how did this year go by so quickly? But it does and it did. And so as we come to celebrate, we have uh, lit all of the four candles, except with the exception of the Christ uh, candle in the center, which will be uh, lit on uh, Saturday afternoon. And we are preparing for a very special celebration, the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. And it depends how we approach this, what we will take away from our Christmas celebration. It's amazing, we have uh, learned here in this short little piece of scripture, a very condensed version of the birth of Jesus. If you read it from uh, the gospel according to Luke, you have all kinds of things going on with Mary running around and all the kind of stuff that's happening, shepherds in the field, blah, 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 blah. An uh, innkeeper seemed to have no compassion and Mary wandering around on the donkey and she's about ready to give birth. There's, there's a lot of drama to it. Here it's almost, okay, this is the way it was. Okay, accept it, it was this way. But, Packed into that condensed version is something that we need to pay very close attention to, and it has to deal with language. Because until this point in time, and this was just the point in time God wanted to come into the world as the flesh of Jesus Christ, people had listened to the stories, had heard the prophets speak, and they really misinterpreted, misunderstood, and passed along bad information, made up rules that didn't uh, really do uh, any kind of truth to the laws that God had been putting down. And we do have to be aware that because of different cultures, different ways people were brought up, different faiths that are out there, uh, no faiths, everything imaginable, People come around us with all kinds of conceptions and misconceptions, truths and uh, falsities about what Christmas or what it means to have a Savior named Jesus Christ. I mean, even in the most simple of our, our times together relationships, it's very difficult for Mars and Venus to connect, for example. And it just so happens, just so happens, that I have a little bit of Mars and Venus that proves the point that I'm making. You know how when a woman says something, is it really what she means? No, no see? It isn't. It absolutely isn't. Now, for example, when a woman says fine, this is the word used to end an argument. When she is right and you better shut up, don't even say another word, fine. Nothing. If you ask her what's wrong and she says nothing, then something is definitely wrong. 
stay on your toes, many arguments can start over nothing, and then end with fine, refer to number one. A loud sigh. This is a nonverbal hint that you are being an idiot, and she's wondering why you are wasting time standing there arguing about nothing, refer to number two. And then there's the go ahead. This is like a double dare, and it's definitely not permission. She wants you to make the right decision, so rethink what you're about to do. This is really good advice, I gotta tell you. Don't worry about it, I got it. This means she's asked you to do something several times, and you didn't, so now she's doing it herself. Uh-oh, this may result in you asking her later what's wrong, to which she will most likely respond, nothing. Then there's the, that's okay. This is a very dangerous warning signal. She will be thinking long and hard about how you will pay for what you did. <laughs> that's okay, I'll get this. Five minutes. If she is getting ready, this could mean 15 to 40 minutes. <laughs> Results may vary, but if you're watching a football game, five minutes max in exactly 300 seconds. Whatever. This means go to, I'm not going to say it, <laughs> you're in big trouble. You may even feel a chill in the air. You know, the hair would go up the back of your neck. Then there's one last one, thanks. She is thanking you. Don't even question it. Just say you're welcome. But if she says thanks a lot, then that's meant as sarcasm and you should definitely not say you're welcome. <laughs> because then she'll reply with whatever. <laughs> Back and forth. Language is a strange animal. I mean, it, it really, really is. And we can misread, mislisten, mishear, missee, whatever that God has been trying to get to us. And what God has been trying all the time since the very beginning of creation, with Adam and Eve and on up through the time until the birth of Jesus Christ, was that I love you. I created you as my children. I have give, I'm going to give you unconditional love. I'm going to bring about justice. I'm going to bring about peace. I'm going to bring about all those things. But for some reason, you don't seem to be getting it. So listen, children, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to send the son, Jesus. And you're going to call him Jesus because that means Savior. And you're also going to call him Emmanuel, because Emmanuel, as you know, means with you. And L means God. God will be with you. And so you are not going to be able to misunderstand this. And when you see the sacrifice, when you see the compassion, when you see the patience, when you see the care that's going to be given, you won't have any question in your mind whatsoever, my intentions and where you stand, surrounded by my love. Well, you know, the, the name is powerful. Whenever the angel told Joseph, you will call him Jesus. Jesus is the Latin derivative of the Greek, uh, no, 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 the Greek derivative of the Latin, Jesus. And you see how my tongue just twisted around that? It's Jesus, and it means Savior. It comes from the Hebrew word, Yahshua. And Yahshua means Savior. I knew I'd come around in circles and mangle that until I finally got it. And I already told you about Emmanuel. El is one of the names of God. Elion, Eli, uh, Eli, Eli, Elohim. And we have Jehovah, we have Yahweh, we have God with us, we have Almighty God, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, and we can go on and on and on, the hundreds of attributes about God. And this is the thing about the names. They have the attributes of the person who owns the names. And in this case, Jesus owns the name Savior, God with you. And this, this is amazing because there's power in that name. You know that song says Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. Even just hearing that name has power. And we know that from even our 
you know, or, or, while I was around us. Names do have, they almost have self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it true? I mean, if someone has a wonderful name, it seems like they go further than people who don't have wonderful names. How many of you know uh, Marion Morrison? Marion Morrison. Um, how about uh, Jean Morrison? Janine Morrison. Okay. Marion Morrison is what John Wayne became. You can't imagine the Duke Marion being called the Duke. And you can't imagine a name like Janine being Marilyn Monroe. And so she became the symbol of beauty and sexuality for whole generations of people because not Janine Morriston, but because of Marilyn Monroe. And I, I was thinking about that and I, I was looking and there was, you ever hear, see that guy out there named Vin Diesel? Yes. Yeah, his name is not Vin Diesel. I mean, Vin Diesel, I mean, man, this guy could plow through anything. He must be a superhero. His name is something like Jack Shrift. I mean, how far is that going to go? But if you got the name of Jesus, and you are the Savior, you got the name of God with you, you got the power. And that is the powerful truth about the name of Jesus. And that power is in the love. And that love is indeed the gift that we receive at Christmas, sometimes making small of it because we focus more on the celebration than we do on the meaning. And there's nothing wrong with that celebration. It really isn't. I love those times when the family comes together. When the grandkids run around and they drive you up a wall and you, you just can't say, you know, what time is their bedtime? When are they going home? Aren't the roads getting bad? You know, you, you go through that, but you wouldn't miss it for all the world. And it's fine. We, and we love the times that our families together. We are sad when our families can't come together. A lot of my family lives 500 miles away, and I won't see them on Christmas, and it's kind of sad. But love means we, we take those sad times, we take the celebration times, we take everything there is, and we make them one time. And because they're made one time, we have the fullness of God's presence in our lives. We have that gift. It came to us. Now, the thing is, what do we do in response to this gift of love? We're supposed to be able to give this gift back to God. I mean, God deserves a Christmas present, does God not? That's the, the word Christmas itself, Christ, Mass. Mass means worship. Christ means Messiah. Worship of the Messiah is Christmas. And we need to figure out what we are getting God for Christmas this year. And I think it needs to be the same unconditional love and grace that God has given to us. Now, once Jesus was asked, he said, people said, after Jesus had said, whenever I was in prison, you visited me. Whenever I was hungry, you gave me food. Whenever I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. Whenever I was a stranger, you took me in, etc., etc., etc. And the people said, when do we ever do that? And then Jesus said, whatever you have given to the least of the people, you have given to me. Now here is maybe the only one time in all of life that is perfectly appropriate to re-gift. Because we take the gift that God has given us and we re-gift it back to God. And then we re-gift it to everybody else that's around. And I can see God smiling. He goes, oh, look what I'm getting. I'm getting back what I gave. Isn't that wonderful? And other people, they won't know it's re-gifted, see? Because they, they won't catch on right away. But if they ever do catch on, by that time, they're going to celebrate it with you. Because what that gift contains is patience. That gift contains kindness. That gift contains justice. 
That gift contains acceptance unconditionally, no matter who it is that that gift is being given to. There's something very sad on the news this morning. And it seems that I think it was Alabama or someplace in the South. Grandfather was out with his three-year-old doing something at this time of year at Christmas. Who knows what? And he stopped at a light. And the light must have changed or something or he spent too long sitting there. And all of a sudden, the car behind him opened fire, shooting into his car and killed the three-year-old. You can't even imagine the road rage that would cause someone to do that, to fire into a car with people in it because it didn't pull out of the light fast enough. We need the re-gift of God's love. Probably more at any time in the world than it's ever been. We need it now. Because this is not an isolated incident. People are impatient. People have become very uncaring. People in our country have become very split with one another. And it's been getting worse. It's time to turn this thing around. It's time for us to be that example of the Christ child. It's time for us to be that gift of unconditional love. It's time for Christmas to mean exactly what God meant it to be, God's love given freely. Amen.